Hello cruel world. My name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist. I assess mentally disordered offenders for a living so that you don't have to. So today is going to be a bit of a tragic case. It's a bit morbid, I'm afraid. I'm going to tell you about a real life case of a suicide. We'll be looking at the factors that contributed, including multiple failures by the police, the paramedics and the mental health services. As a consultant forensic psychiatrist, obviously I do a lot of criminal cases, but I also do civil cases like breach of duty. So having carried out dozens of these cases related to suicide, I've had to look at the failings in mental health systems uh, that led to people committing suicide. And for a while now, I've kind of thought about doing one of these cases to let you guys know, but I've always felt a little bit uncomfortable because it feels like I might be breaking the family's trust to be talking about their relatives who have killed themselves. So I've actually found this cautionary tale that's out in the public domain of a man called Adam Stanmore. And the reason why it's relevant uh, to recent times is because there was an inquest about this, which was released just in August 2021, so about a month before I recorded this episode. So who was Adam Stanmore? What were the events that led up to his suicide? What did the inquest find? What are my personal and professional opinions on this case? And what were the mistakes that led him to die? And the ultimate question, which is, could this have been prevented and how? And as a bonus, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the themes that come up in my own assessments without breaking any confidentiality. Okay, so first off, Adam Stanmore, he was a 37 year old man of mixed heritage from Oxford and he was found dead on the 13th of June, 2019. He had a reported history of depression and also of type one diabetes. So on the 23rd of April, 2019, Adam contacted his own GP and he reported paranoid thoughts and he was saying that he was hearing voices telling him to kill himself. So Adam was referred by his GP to the Oxford Health NHS Foundation Trust mental health team and he was seen on the same day. Following that assessment, Adam was given a post-it note with the telephone number of Mind, which is a mental health charity, and he was sent back to his GP for antidepressant treatment. Obviously, I've got a lot to say about the standard of that assessment of the consultation, but we'll come back to that later. So on the morning of the 18th of May 2019, Adam left his mother's house and he left a note saying and I uh, stating that and I quote, I've had enough. In the early afternoon, he obtained a knife from a neighbour who called the Thames Valley Police who went out because they were concerned about his welfare. So Adam was found by the police and he was sitting on his own on a fence and he was quiet. He was kind of staring ahead. And then when they approached him, Adam said, I want to kill myself. So the arresting response officers then tried to approach him and they saw that there was a knife in his waistband. And as an officer was removing the knife, Adam put his hand on it. So the other police officers, they discharged their tasers and on three occasions they did that and they used force to restrain him and to remove the knife from him. And he remained prone on the ground, so pushed down on the ground with his legs in restraint until the police van arrived. Now, to me, on the surface, it sounds as if they were a bit heavy-handed. I mean, he's suicidal. He shouldn't be treated like a violent criminal. But having said that, I wasn't there. And the police, they have to deal with violent crime. They literally, sometimes some police officers are killed in the line of duty, so it's not really my call. But for me, the crux of the matter is whether it depends on, on how much they tried to de-escalate the situation. Did they really make an effort to get him to comply and drop the weapon, or did they just pounce on him? I don't know the answer to that. Adam was then taken to Arbington Police Station, and on arrival, he was barely conscious. His blood sugar levels were critically low. So quick biology lesson for you guys. We all have a pancreas. Our pancreas secretes insulin, which lowers our blood sugar. But in diabetes, our pancreas doesn't function properly. We don't have that insulin. So people generally have a high blood sugar. So if Adam's blood sugar was low, then that can't have been his illness. It means that he must have self-medicated and over-medicated with insulin. And he again told the police that he wanted to kill himself. So I think that's all connected. So the South Central Ambulance Service called to convey Adam to the hospital. And that was for the physical and his mental health assessment and for treatment. And no further action was taken in regards to his arrest, which I assume means that the charges were dropped. Now later, the evidence from the paramedics is that they were not aware that Adam had told police officers 
that he wanted to kill himself. But during the journey in the ambulance, Adam told the paramedics that he had overdosed on insulin and had tried to kill himself. And this information was recorded and it was later deleted and it only came to light about this deletion during the inquest. Again, I've got some thoughts on that, you have to wait. Adam was allowed to leave the ambulance before it even reached the hospital. So no mental health capacity assessment was carried out. Very briefly, capacity is the ability to weigh up and make a decision. So for example, if Adam knew he had a low blood sugar, though he felt he could deal with it, and he, you know, for example, could eat sweet snacks and he didn't want to wait for ages in a hospital, and if he could, if he could, if he could logically talk through that decision, then by definition, he's got capacity. But if he had depression, which appears was the case, and he had these like negative cognitions, uh, you know, issues with a lack of focus and concentration, impacting his cognitive ability, if for all of those reasons, he just said he wanted to die, which does seem to be the case, then clearly he doesn't have capacity. By the way, see my video on Britney Spears about her conservative ship, which is kind of like the American version of capacity. And I talk about the difference in legislator in that video. So go check it out. The other thing that happened was that Adam did not have any additional treatment. There was no more blood, there was no checks on his blood sugar. The paramedics then provided information to the police and the control center that Adam was fully recovered. Then the police located him a few hours after he'd left the, the ambulance, but they were reassured by the lack of markers on their own system and by the information that's provided by the paramedics. So they thought at that point in time that Adam was safe. On top of all those missed opportunities, the Oxford Mental Health Street Triage, whose job, whose role it is, is to go around finding people on the street who need urgent psychiatric help. They thought they didn't need to perform a face-to-face -face mental health assessment on the basis of information that police officers had provided. They felt that Adam seemed fine. So it seems like there's a lot of false reassurances going on. So Adam was later captured on CCTV around midnight after the police had left him. Tragically, his body was found on the 13th of June, 2019. He had this like ligature around his neck and he was surrounded by insulin boxes. So <clears throat> they thought it's likely that he died shortly after the last time he was seen. The inquest concluded that Alan, Adam died of suicide either by hanging or by hypoglycemia, which is a very low blood sugar, which obviously would have been caused by the overdose of insulin. So what did the inquest find? And also what are my professional opinions on this? And what were the mistakes that led him to die? So in my view, the circumstances which contributed to Adam to, to die was that he didn't have appropriate psychiatric follow-up and the risk of self-harm and suicide were not appropriately assessed and managed by the mental health team. Now I have to say it was pretty good that he was seen on the same day that the GP referred him because usually when GPs refer to psychiatrists, there's a gap of weeks. So what happens is if people are, if the GP's very concerned about a patient, then they'll send them to the accident and emergency department. And usually they have to wait for a few hours. And it's not a long wait, but it's, from my experience, it's not a great situation to be in because many patients there are at the lowest ebb and they have to wait in this busy, chaotic, emergency department where you might have like drunk and occasionally aggressive patients. But what do I think about the actual assessment? Well, I think it's very clear to say that it was quite substandard, wasn't it? I mean, it's hard to judge exactly how bad it was without seeing the notes myself, but it kind of depends on the risk assessment. So if Adam said that he was feeling safe by himself, if he told them that he could cope convincingly, if he said he had like a good support system around him, if he said that the voices that he reported to the GP had stopped or they weren't bothering him, if he said all these things, then I think it might have been reasonable, but I think that's all unlikely really. If you think about his presentation to the GP that very same day, I don't see how those things could have changed. And also, I think we have to ask ourselves, what's the point of giving Adam a number for a charity, which he could have Googled himself, and then sending him back to the GP? Because the GP was the person who made the referral to the mental health services in the first place, because the GP would have thought that Adam was too risky for them to carefully support him. And on top of that, there was an inappropriate handover of information between the ambulance service control and the paramedics that were dispatched to the police station and between the police custody staff and the paramedics. 
So as I said before, on top of all of that, there's evidence that the paramedics were not, a, um, not made aware that Adam had told police officers that he wanted to kill himself. And to me, I, that's mind blowing because basically he's going to hospital for two reasons. Number one, his really low blood sugar and number two, his suicidality. So if they don't make that clear, then what, what did they say? What kind of handover was it? You know, clearly that is a very large area of concern in my view. And then following that, during the journey in the ambulance, Adam told the paramedics that he'd overdosed on insulin and that he tried to kill himself. And as I mentioned before, that information was recorded and then it was deleted and then it was found again during the inquest. To me, it seems like this was a cover-up because why else would you delete that information apart from to dodge blame? Also, on top of all of these things, Adam was allowed to leave that ambulance before it reached the hospital. And as I mentioned, there was no mental health capacity assessment. So there seemed to be some lack of clarity in the handover between the healthcare and the paramedics at the police station. And again, I think this is pretty basic. It's not as if Adam's got this long, convoluted, complicated psychiatric history. Basically, the only information they had to pass on was that he was actively suicidal. So if they did a very basic risk assessment, there clearly are lots of red flags that indicate to me that he's a high risk of suicide. So let's go through some of them for your education. He was hearing voices, he's male, he actively had a recent suicide attempt when he was sat with a knife, he left a suicide note and it seems that he didn't want to be found because he went missing. So let's contrast that, for example, with say a female who threatened an overdose after say breaking up with a boyfriend, who called the emergency services herself. Like let's think about how different those two risk scenarios are. And for all you trolls before you uh, get all excited, I'm not making a sexist comment. Females are known to self-harm more the males are known to actually go through with completed suicide more. So being male is a significant risk factor. So the attending paramedic should have carried out a formal mental capacity assessment and also a self-harm assessment when Adam informed them that he'd taken an overdose with the intention of killing himself. And that information should have been escalated. And as I said before, there were deletions from the ambulance electronic patient records, which to me means that significant information was not available to the future healthcare professionals that should have carried on looking after him. So these issues impacted the perception and the assessment of presenting risk to, of Adam's physical and mental health so that the other doctors didn't know how, how dangerous of a situation this was. So let's now have a look at what uh, Adam's family members said. So his ex-partner said, and I quote, while we were already aware that there had been failings in Adam's care, we were not fully prepared for some of the evidence that came to light. We have been truly shocked and saddened by the blatant disregard towards Adam in his final hours by those who could have saved him in particular, the ambulance crew. We can only conclude that a great number of people involved in Adam's care simply did not care. So, I mean, those are pretty damning words, but ugh, it's kind of hard not to agree with them. Okay, so what were the overriding themes in my own breach of duty assessments? So other assessments of similar cases that I've seen. I'm happy to answer that question, but before I do that, let me just introduce you to this channel. So what you're watching is a Psych for Sore Minds. My name's Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist. I assess mentally disordered offenders in prisons, in psychiatric units, and in courts. This channel covers a whole range of mental health and uh, topics and issues, from individual diagnoses, to interviewing ex-patients, to high profile true crime cases, some episodes are related to offending because that's my area of specialty. Some episodes like this one are, are related to other aspects of mental health and mental illness. What I'm trying to say is there's something for everybody on this channel. So I implore you to please, please, please subscribe. Not only does it help me out immeasurably, but it actually makes you more noticeable to barmen. So you're not standing there like an idiot waiting to get served, flashing your money while everyone around you is getting their pints. Guaranteed all your money back. Also, if you're a regular viewer, you might know that I've got a book coming out in spring next year. It's gonna be called Into Minds. It's gonna be a bit like my videos, but a lot more autobiographical, a lot deeper. It's gonna be dope, you have to cop it. Right, so back to the video. What are my own findings for my breach of duty assessment? So just to be really clear, this is for civil cases where somebody has committed suicide, I look through the medical notes and the medical records and witness statements, etc. So I see if there's been a breach of duty. I see if 
the mental health services were responsible for not looking after or supporting people that ended up killing themselves. And I have to say that by far, the biggest risk factor that I see is a poor risk assessment. So what happens is most cases like Adams, they come in with some form of recent deliberate self-harm and the patient tells services that they no longer want to kill themselves, which could be true, but when you think about it, it could be exactly what the patient thinks they need to say to be sent on their merry way so they actually have the opportunity to end their life. So one of the mistakes that I see is that their reassurances are just taken at face value and the assessors don't take objective evidence into account. For example, they don't have conversations with the patient's family members who might have spoken to them recently who might have been worried. I've seen that time and time again. So despite this, they discharged the patient anyway. The next most salient factor, in my opinion, from my experience, is returning the patient back to their original situation or their original stresses. So for example, that person might have issues with peers at their hostel, they might be in an abusive relationship, and the services, the mental health services, don't try and address or get support for the problem. Now, obviously, doctors and nurses are not magicians, okay? We can't fix everybody's problems, but we can at least start the ball rolling to try and help. So we can um, arrange or start arranging alternative accommodation. We can put people in a crisis house if they're the victim of domestic violence. We can get them in touch with social services. We can get them in touch with the police if there's, if, uh, you know, there's serious violence at home. So to conclude, this is a heartbreaking case. And my thought goes out to, to Adam's family. And I feel this, that, that the services may have been negligent. The inquest felt the same and their relatives felt the same. And of course, it's only fair for a bit of balance to put this all in context. Mental health services help thousands of suicidal people. I know, because I've literally worked for many of them. Every year, thousands of suicides are prevented, and there are loads of success stories, which you just don't hear about them because there's no inquest, they're not in the press, there's no coverage. It's only where things go wrong that you hear about them. But when things go wrong, as you can see from Adam's case, the consequences are tragic. Okay, final thing before I finish, I've got a question for you, dear viewers. Apologies for that noise in the background, that's my errant hamster. But my question is, do you have any experience of people trying to commit suicide or, or being suicidal or peri-suicidal, so thinking about suicide? And if so, what has been your experience directly or through your friends and family with mental health services? Have they been helpful? Have they been supportive? Have they been there for you? Or have they been a bit uncaring, dismissive, even negligent? I genuinely would like to know about your experiences, so please tell me about them in the comments section below. Okay, that's enough from me. That's the end of my video. Remember to stay euthymic and do not forget whatever happens. I love you.